Colossians 2 verse 8 to 10, it says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Paul here is saying, beware, watch out, look out, lest anyone, not, not demonic spirits, not the rulers and forces of this dark age, he's saying people. Beware lest people, probably well-meaning people, cheat you, deceive you, rob you, steal from you. How do they do it? Through philosophy, empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And here is the crux of my message. And you are complete in Him. So what these people, well-meaning or not, want to cheat us out of through philosophy, empty deceit and traditions of men, basic principles of the world, is the truth that you are made complete in Christ. That the finished work of the cross is enough to complete you. You don't need to find yourself, complete yourself. You don't need to get any better. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. I'm just gonna trust that Logan, my voice is able to be heard at the back. Can we give it up for Logan on the sound? He's gonna fight this rain now. I'm not gonna lose my voice and start yelling, so I'm just gonna trust that you can hear me. Holy Spirit, help us. Stop the rain in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. Just for about 35 minutes, that'd be great. Lord, thank You. Amen. We'll just put like an angel over the roof. <laughs> thank You, Lord. All right. <laughs> I don't know why you're surprised. <laughs> We're like, wow, prayer works. <laughs> I just want that to last for 35 minutes. That's all, that's the only thing. All right, story about being complete. I've got my notes, that kind of threw me. I don't know where I am. All right. <laughs> Have you ever tried to do something that has already been completed? I've been doing this a lot um, since our church has grown and we've accumulated more staff. Hannah is the queen of telling me, boss, it's already done. Uh, as the, you know, when the church started, I'm doing everything. And as the church grows, you pull more and more away. And uh, I'm thinking of things now that, hey, has that been done? Has that been done? Has that been done? And our staff are constantly saying, already taken care of, which is a great thing. Amen. I am trying to complete something that has already been completed. And a lot of us as believers, we actually live like this. We are trying to complete something that has been completed by the finished work of the cross. Some of us are trying to be better, know better, do better, become more holy, whatever it might be. But Jesus is telling us that we are complete in Him. The finished work of the cross after those 70 or 80 baptisms a couple of weeks ago, we've had I think maybe six between this service and the last service and we've still got the 6 p.m. But these people that have been baptised and filled with the Holy Spirit, I need you to understand and know that you are complete in Him. You are complete in Him. There's nothing more you need to do. There's nothing more that you need to be. You are made complete in Christ, not by your works, but by His works. And the Bible says, beware, lest anybody cheat you out of this truth. This is a truth that will change your life, not because of a good sermon, but because of the truth of the Word of God. We have Christians, I understand the world trying to complete themselves. I understand the world trying to find themselves and get a sense of peace. But when I see Christians trying to complete themselves, it worries me because the Bible says that you are complete in Christ. You don't come to Christ and then struggle for the rest of your life trying to be better. No, He makes you better. He makes you brand new. And if you believe in Him and you, you've, you've gone whole hog for Jesus, for lack of a better word, I'm here to tell you that you are complete in Christ. If you're single and you think when you get married, you'll be complete, uh, news for you, news flash, wrong. You are complete in Christ. If you are married and you're believing for your first home, I am believing for your first home with you. Amen. But 
If you think when you get your first home, you're gonna be complete, uh, wrong, you've got it wrong. If you think that when you lose that flab and get some abs, you're gonna be complete in Christ, uh, you are wrong, you are complete in Him. Can somebody say amen? amen? And so He says, let nobody cheat you. Let no one come and, and rob you of this truth. How do they rob us of this truth? Number one, through philosophy, which, is, which actually means, I know this might irk some people, traditional Jewish theology. And I love studying the Jewish traditions. I love studying the Gospels and how the Jewish culture saw it. But you ever met those Christians that go too far? You ever met those Christians that unless you're looking at it the Jewish way, there ain't no other way? The Bible actually warns us, let nobody cheat you through the traditional Jewish theology, which actually falls under the realm of philosophy, that you are complete in Him. It's great. I study, I love it. I love the, 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 the parables through Jewish eyes, all of that. But to say that you're not complete unless you understand Jewish traditions, friends, that is a, a thing that is trying to steal from you the one simple truth that you are complete in Christ. Number two, empty deceit, which simply means worthless deception that gets you nowhere. Like it's a deception, it's a lie through empty deceit. It's like it sounds good, but on the inside, it's empty, it's not valuable and it actually gets you nowhere. And then the next one is the traditions of men, the hand-me-downs of people. My family has done it this way for so long. My ancestors have done it this way for so long. And these are the traditions. Some, some traditions are great, but some traditions the Bible says can actually uh, steal and rob us from experiencing the power of God. And it, traditions can actually become the very thing that robs us from the truth that you have been made complete in Him. And so there are all kinds of people right now that are telling us that you've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to uh, adhere to the Sabbath. You've got to observe uh, the Passover and all of these traditions. They're traditions of men. They are not for the new covenant believers. This is not what happens anymore. You are, you are saved and healed and complete by the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. You are complete in Him. Then it says the basic principles of this world. The Bible says that, that, uh, we, that God's ways are higher than our ways. In other words, He doesn't think like you and I. There's ways that He does things that are completely different to the way that we do things. And the basic principles of the world, uh, uh, gravity, um, logic, you know, just the basic rationale of the world will actually rob you from the fact that you've been made complete in Him. Hey, we need a new building. We need at least $10 million to get a building of the size that we need, either to build one or buy one and renovate it. Either way, it's upwards of $10 million. Full disclosure, we've got only a million dollars of savings. Praise God for the million dollars of savings. But, but we have a million dollars in the bank as a church, just on a million dollars. Now friends, the basic principles of the world that come through BNZ and other banking people would tell us that we can't get a building. But how many know we don't live by sight, we live by faith? How many know that the basic principles of the world might say there's only 1 million, how are you gonna get 10 million? But I follow Jesus who's a miracle worker. I follow Jesus who's a way maker. I follow Jesus who doesn't bound me by the traditions and the basic principles of the world or numbers on a screen, but by His Word, by His Word. And so He warns us here, don't let people cheat you, rob you, steal from you, experiencing the fullness of the completeness in Christ by the basic principles of the world. They're out there. They're well-meaning people. They might even be sitting next to you. I'm not just talking about people out there. I'm talking about people in the church who have become comfortable in their Christianity and used to believe and don't believe anymore. Don't let their unbelief rub off on you. You have been made complete in Christ. It really is about the way we see things. Matthew 6, verse 22 to 23 says that the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Basically what Jesus is saying is, Life is about seeing clearly. 
if your eye is good, if you're seeing straight, he's not talking about, you know, if you get a 2020 result from Specsavers. He's not saying that. What he's saying, are you seeing correctly? If you're seeing straight, if you're, the Bible, in, in, I think it's in the King James Version, it says, if your eye is single. In other words, you've got single vision. You, you are seeing the Scriptures. You're seeing life how I see life. It says your whole body will be full of light. It, I found in the last 12 years of pastoring is that most of people's problems, over 90% of people's problems is just them not seeing correctly. It's just us not seeing what Christ has done. And so when we make our eye good, when we see good, when we see how He sees, our whole body will be full of light. Can I say something this morning uh, that might be a little bit controversial? And you, you love controversial, that's why you're here. Um, you, <laughs> I don't need to ask for permission, but, but it is not normal for the Christian to struggle. It's not normal for the Christian to struggle. There is a culture right now of Christians constantly struggling. Now, I'm not saying you can never struggle. I'm not saying there aren't struggles in life. There are definitely struggles in life. But a perpetual pattern of struggle as a believer, I would suggest you're not seeing right. Your eye's not good. Because I was bound by sin and He sent His Son to, to die on a cross to make me brand new, to give me a relationship with the God of the universe. I'm just a pilgrim passing through the earth and when this life is over, I spend eternity with Him. Friends, the constant struggle, the constant woe is me, groveling on the floor like I'm nothing but a worm. No, the Bible says that you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God and you have access into the throne room of grace in your time of need. Friend, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? The struggle is not normal. Let struggle be just a small season that we overcome. Let's not build a Christian theology of I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I've got everything I need that pertains to life and godliness. The Bible says I'm complete in Him, but I'm just const constantly struggling. I come against that lie that you will struggle for the rest of your life. It's absolutely ridiculous. He's come to give you life and life abundantly. My goodness, life is a gift. You are not an accident. I've never won anything, people say to me. I'm just, I just don't, I've got no favour on my life. I've never won even a raffle ticket. Friends, you won a race of over 500 million sperm and you got, you got to the end. You got to the end, man. You same bolt eats your heart out. You won over 500 million. Flippin' heck. If you're not favoured, I don't know who is. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but really, if you've got that, that God before the foundation of the world pulled you out, you won the race. Oh my goodness, that brings purpose to your life. You come up like, man, I am the head and not the tail. Excuse the pun. <laughs> That's not in my notes, by the way. That's just Holy Spirit flow. <laughs> you, you, you are the tail. You, you know. Anyway. <laughs> oh, you gotta have fun in church. Life is a gift. It's not a constant struggle. Okay, three things. We're moving on to the holy stuff. All right, three things. <laughs> three things. That will help you understand that you are complete in Christ. Number one, I am forgiven. I'm forgiven. And I know this seems basic, but this is what people want to cheat you out of. This truth that you've been forgiven. It might, it might sound simple, but friends, people struggle with uh, guilt and shame and condemnation a lot. You'll be surprised how many Christians, how many blood-bought, spirit-filled believers shuck at a bucketing and, and, they're, and they're praying in tongues and they're, they're doing all the stuff, but they, they, they actually struggle with guilt, shame and condemnation. And so the enemy wants to cheat you out of the truth that you have been Forgiven. The Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. East is kind of this way-ish. If, if you wanna know where your sin has gone, where your transgression has gone, 
If you are one of the three or four people that got baptised today, in that moment, your old life died and you got given a brand new one and God removed your sin. If I walk this way, how far do I have to go to get to east? You actually never get there, right? You just keep going eastward. East is not a destination, it's a direction. And if I start walking this way, as long as I can for the rest of my life, I'll actually never uh, get to the destination called west. And the Bible says, as far as east is from west, that's how far your sins have been taken from you. Come on, friends. You don't need to go to God guilty, begging, shame, trying to be full of, you know, like just dealing. This is not a fight against sin anymore. Jesus dealt with sin at the foot of the cross. He has taken your transgressions and your sins as far as the East is from the West. I'm, I'm telling you, when I caught this revelation as a brand new believer, my whole life changed because I, do you love me, Lord? As far as the east is from the west. <laughs> no, he's just tricking us. It's like we're playing a game here. <laughs> as far as the east is from the west. Hebrews 8, which is a, uh, a fulfilment of a prophetic uh, word about the new covenant. He repeats it in Hebrews 8. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And listen to this. And their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. I'm here to tell you that you are forgiven, not only of your past, but of your present and of your future. The Bible says that He will remember your sins no more. In other words, it's not that I go to God and say sorry and then He makes a decision to forgive me. He made a decision to forgive me before I ever sinned. He made a decision to make a contract, a covenant with me and say, I will remember your sins no more, Adam. I will remember your sins no more, Tony. I will remember your sins no more, Jared. I will remember your sins no more. He chooses to forget your sins. What a God we serve. I got taught this by my father-in-law and we did this on our, the first day of our marriage. Uh, we woke up after we got, uh, uh, we got married and the next day we we're in a hotel room. We made a, a decision to uh, forgive each other before the opposite person ever does anything wrong to us. Just a free bit of marriage advice. If you, if you think that, you know, you, you, your wife, your, your husband, your friend, your parents, your kids, that, that when the offence comes, that you'll then have enough courage and holiness, for lack of a better word, to forgive them in the moment, you're probably wrong. If we're gonna forgive like God has forgiven us, because it says to forgive like God has forgiven. The way Christ has forgiven us is to make a decision to forgive us before we mess up. And so I made a, a commitment with my wife in both ways and we said, I'm making a commitment to forgive you for the rest of your life. I'm making a commitment to forgive you for the rest of your life. And that's how Christ forgives us. I am forgiven past, present and future. And people are scared to preach this way because be careful, you're giving the congregation a license to sin. Nothing could be further from the truth. When somebody gets a revelation of my sins are forgiven, past, present and future, it causes you to wanna live holy and please the Father. It does the exact opposite. I remember I had a dog growing up and, and it was a big Rottweiler. And, and when we when we walked it, we trained it so that when the, the, the leash was off, it would not run away. It's a great uh, example of the fact that when He remembers our sins no more, He takes the rules, He takes the reg regulations, He takes the yoke of religion off of us. And if you truly get a revelation of that, you're not gonna run away from Him, you're gonna stick very close to Him. That's what it's like. I mean, when I realised that everything that I've ever done or ever will do had been forgiven, all of a sudden my conduct changed, my life changed because I realised I'm forgiven and I realised I am complete in Him. Come on, someone say, I am complete in Him. I love the story in Luke chapter seven of the prostitute that comes into a, a dinner feast, a dinner party, and Jesus is there, Simon is there, uh, there's different disciples there, and there's a bunch of Pharisees, and she comes in as a street woman, and she, she, she uh, rushes through and comes and breaks all of the social constructs and starts to wash Jesus' feet with her hair. 
very out the gate type stuff. It's, it's awkward, it's weird, it's, it's, it's not according to our social constructs or religious norms. And the, the, the Pharisees pipe up, the voice of the, of the religious spirit pipes up and, and they start having a conversation about why she's doing this and how dare she and how do you let her do this, Jesus? And in Luke 7, 47, Jesus makes this statement. He says, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven because she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. When I first read this, I was rocked. It kind of messed me up, this verse, uh, because I saw that this prostitute woman had a very dark lifestyle. And I thought, Lord, you know, I had a really dark lifestyle too. And, and, and you see people that are like, that have come out of the world in a really heavy way, they end up being very passionate for Jesus. You've noticed that? When you realise what you've been forgiven of, you're very passionate for Jesus. Like the people that are doing cartwheels at the front here and they're, you know, and, and we're like, oh, I don't know about that. But you don't know what they've been forgiven of. You don't know what they've come out of. You don't know what Jesus has rescued them from. And, and so Jesus says, to him who is forgiven little, they will love little. And to him who is forgiven much, they will love much. And I started to think about that for people really that have lived more of a, a squeaky clean life in church. Like my wife said, I think it was last week, understanding the depravity of sin. Understanding the depravity of the fact that even though the prostitute had a dark lifestyle, sin is sin. And so it's not about if you had a bad lifestyle, you're gonna love Jesus more. It's about understanding the fact, how the, 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 the gravity, the enormity of the entirety of sin that I was once bound by, no matter my upbringing, no matter I was in church or out of church, my sin is much and therefore I will love much. Friend, if you've grown up in the church and you say things like, I don't have a testimony, friend, you have the best testimony. You yeah, have the best testimony. I thank God that my kids don't have to have my testimony, but they can have a testimony of growing up in Freedom Centre. They can have a testimony of growing up in the house of God. They can have a testimony of, yeah, not that they won't struggle, they'll have their own struggles, but they also need to understand that they have sinned just as much as the broken person that comes in and gets saved. They have got to be saved just as much as that person. So to him who is forgiven of a lot will love a lot the Bible says. That's what Jesus said. And I know we look at the prostitute and we think, yeah, yeah, she's passionate because she was forgiven of a lot. You were forgiven of just as much. You were forgiven of just as much. And when I come to that realisation, my passion goes through the roof. My intimacy goes through the roof. My love goes through the roof because I truly know that I am forgiven. Number two, I am a good tree. Everyone say, I am a good tree. What does this mean? The Bible says Jesus, out of His own mouth, says every good tree produces good fruit and every bad tree produces bad fruit. And what most of us would do when we look at that Scripture is we say, right, I've got to produce good fruit. I'm a Christian, I love Jesus. Now I've got to live a lifestyle that produces good fruit. And it's the wrong way to look at it. The proper way to look at it, that Scripture, is that Jesus is saying that every good tree naturally produces good fruit. So the fight of our faith, which we just said, be warned that nobody cheat you out of this, is the fact of your belief in the fact that you are a good tree. If you believe by faith that you are a good tree, that Christ has made you a good tree, that I am a good tree because of what He's done, the natural, uh, uh, result of that, the byproduct of that is that we produce good fruit. Religion will tell you, get your fruit right. Religion will tell you, produce more fruit, squeeze it out, modify your behaviour. Jesus tells us, just be concerned with the fact that you're a good tree. This will literally change everything. This will change your prayers from Father, help me to overcome in this area and that area. Instead, you wake up in the morning and I say, Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you that it's made me a good tree. I am no longer a bad tree, but I am a good tree in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that a good tree must produce good fruit. And I'm gonna go about my life loving you because you've made me a good tree. And the byproduct of that is that I will produce good fruit. Come on, someone say, I am a good tree. That's pretty hard to believe that if you did something wrong. 
yesterday, last night, this morning. But friend, if you love Jesus, if you're a follower of Him, if you love on Him, listen, the Bible says, beware that anybody cheats you out of the truth that you've been made complete in Him. You are a good tree. Romans 6, says, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. In other words, it's saying here that righteousness, the revelation of righteousness, the revelation of I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not by anything that I've done, but by what He's done, that will produce its fruit to holiness. So it's not do holy, it's be holy. It's understanding that righteousness dwells within me. It's understanding that it's not my righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. And that belief system, that faith in the fact that He has made me righteous, that He has made me a good tree will result, my fruit will be unto holiness. Friend, if you've struggled to try and be a good Christian, I apologise to anybody that has taught you that you have to try your best. Nothing could be further from the truth. Holiness is a fruit of righteousness. Holiness is a fruit of understanding. Thank you that you made me a good tree. You don't need to work any longer. You don't need to try hard any longer. And you know what I mean by that, right? Like strive, it's not like not care, but you don't need to strive to modify your behaviour. It's understanding I've been made a good tree. I'm a good tree. If you know anything about plants, you know anything about trees, you understand and you know that you can't make a tree bear fruit. You've just got to give it water and sun and all of the good things. The result is an overflow of goodness, an overflow of the right ingredients. Fruit pops out everywhere. As you're trying to be good, trying to feed the poor, trying to get on top of this addiction, trying to read my Bible, trying to pray. Da, da, da. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Hold on a second. Thank you, Lord, that I'm a good tree. It's a way better place to live. Number three, I am clean. I am clean. And it's not because you had a shower this morning. I am clean. Just by show of hands, who's a morning shower? Who's a night shower? Get to the altar. <laughs> Get to the altar. <laughs> I'm a morning guy. Anyway. <laughs> Colossians, uh, sorry, I am clean, I am clean. John 15 verse three says this. You are, everyone say already clean because of the Word which I've spoken to you. And so most Christians I find are trying to get clean. Not realising that Jesus has said, you are already clean. You are already clean. But why? Why are you clean? Because of the Word which I have spoken to you. When Jesus proclaims over your life, you are clean you are clean. When Jesus proclaims over your life that you are free and free indeed, you best believe that you are free and free indeed. When Jesus proclaims over your life that you are a son, you best believe that you are a son. When Jesus proclaims that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you better believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are already clean. Why? Because of the Word which I have spoken to you. I thank God for the power of the Word and what it declares over my life. And I'm gonna end it on this Scripture and we're gonna land it here this morning. Colossians 1 verse 21 to 23. If we can get the band up, that'd be great. It says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. This is who we were. Before you gave your life to Jesus, before you knew who you were in Christ, before you got baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit, all that stuff. We were once alienated and enemies of God in our mind. By how? Our wicked works, our sin separated us from God. This is who we were, were. Yet now, everyone say yet now. Yeah. I love the yet nows in Scripture. I love the buts in Scripture. I, I love, I love the, the, the contrast, the moving and the, the shaking of our, of our thinking and our framework. It says, yet now, He has reconciled in the body of His flesh, not your flesh. You don't have to work in your own strength and in your own flesh to be reconciled to God. It says that He has reconciled, He has already reconciled in the body of His flesh. How? Through death. And then He takes us who were once alienated and were once enemies of God. And He takes us and He presents us to God 
Three things. And I know I get excited about a lot of Scriptures, but can I genuinely say this to you? This Scripture, this part of the Scripture, literally, literally has shaped my whole life. My whole life. It says He presents us to the Lord as three things. Holy, holy. What do you mean? I thought only like people that, you know, are real, like super saints, they're holy. No. Brother, sister, friend, if you're a follower of Jesus, He has, by what He has done in the flesh on the cross, made you holy. Holy means set apart, sanctified, not of this world. Set apart for holy use. And again, the voice of religion will tell you that you aspire. Now, now I'm not talking about conditional. I'm talking about, yes, there is a requirement. There's Scriptures about be holy in all of our conduct. We gotta live this out. But positionally, the moment you put your faith in Christ, positionally, you've been given the status of holy. Seems too good to be true. It is, it's the Gospel. The Gospel is the too good to be true news. That's the direct translation of the Gospel. It's not just the good news, it's the too good to be true news. And part of that news is that He's made you holy by what He done on the cross. Friend, if you could believe that. There's a verse in Leviticus of all places, full of law, Old Testament, it's great to read it. There's a verse in Leviticus that just powerful. It says that when the priest would come and he would lay his hand on the lamb, it's just this verse that just like sticks out because it's all about our requirements, right? But in this verse, it says this. It says, whoever touches the lamb will be made holy. The, the holiness of the lamb will be transferred to the person. It says, whoever, whoever touches the Lamb will be made holy. Friends, I'm here to tell you that you are holy not because of anything that you could do, but because you've touched the Lamb. But because the Lamb is holy, and He transfers His holiness. He transfers His righteousness. He transfers His goodness. All we've got to do is touch the Lamb. Whoever touches the Lamb will be made holy. Lord, help us to understand this. Friends, this will shift everything for you. This will shake every religious bone in your body. If you're sitting here thinking, yeah, but what about that verse? 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 What? Just realise, okay, Lord, <laughs> something has tried to cheat me out of this truth. And I'll, I'll just be honest with you, people that don't believe that truth live in defeat. People who believe in it walk in victory. The fruit is there. He has made me and He has made you holy. It says that He has presented us not only as holy, but as blameless. Oh man. Most people think that in the Old Testament, God was like on a war against sin. And then in the New Testament, He got woke. <laughs> it's not true. God punished sin in the Old Testament and God still punishes sin now, but in a very different way. God still has to put the blame for my sin and for your sin on someone. And if I don't choose to follow Jesus, how many know I take the punishment for my sin? I end up in an eternity in hell. That's the punishment for my sin and your sin. So God, the Father, blames me for my sin. But the moment I put my faith in Christ, it's not like He goes soft and doesn't blame sin anymore. He's just blamed Jesus for your sin. Bible says that Jesus has become the propitiation for our sins, which means that all of God's anger, all of God's wrath was stored up in a bowl. And on that day on the cross of Calvary, He poured and emptied out all of His anger against sin, not on you, not on me, but on His Son, Jesus. 
that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And now you stand as someone who loves Jesus as blameless. There's no blame on you anymore. God is not blaming you for your sin. He blamed His Son. Why are you still blaming yourself? He's presented me as holy. He's presented me as blameless. And then the Bible says, He's presented me as above reproach. Above reproach means that nobody can point the finger at you and say, look at her, look at him, look at the way that they're, aren't they meant to be a, it's reproach. The Bible says He's lifted us up to a place of above reproach, above reproach. People always talk about the theology of Job and I know there's lessons to be learnt in Job, but you know, Satan is no longer going to the Father, having a board meeting in heaven about your life. Oh, well, God must have allowed it, brother. Rubbish theology. Can I just say, rubbish theology. Bible says in Revelation 12, that Satan was kicked out of heaven and there's found no place for him any longer. The enemy is not walking in. Excuse me, Father, are you, are you busy? Well, I've actually got an 11 o'clock. Can you come back at, good, because I wanted to speak to you about Greg. Comes back in at 11.45. Come in. It's not happening. I'm not a disciple of Job. I'm a disciple of Jesus. And if you think that the enemy is, I just wanna set you free this morning. The enemy is on the earth, prowling like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's not having a board meeting in heaven any longer. The cross of Calvary changed all of that. And if you're living under the condemnation of the Old Testament, friend, come up higher. Come up higher. Live in the freedom that Jesus paid for. Live in the abundant life that Jesus paid for. I have been made holy. I've been made blameless and I've been made above reproach. Come on, let's say it. Say, I am holy. I am blameless, I am above reproach. Here's the condition, here's the, you don't need to say here's the condition, but But here's the condition, here's what it says. If, everyone say if. If indeed you continue in the faith. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away. Yeah, because many Christians start here and then they're moved away by life. They're moved away by the squeezing of life. Maybe by bad teaching and bad doctrine and religious thinking. They're moved away. It says, as long as you continue in the faith, be grounded and steadfast and never be moved away from the hope of the Gospel which you've already heard. Not another Gospel. I love, man, Paul comes after this stuff, right? Remember in Galatians, if anybody, he says, he says, if anybody comes to you, he says, even if me, Even if me as Paul, I come to you with another Gospel. He says, even if an angel from heaven, read this, it's in Galatians 1. Even if an angel from heaven comes and the skies rip open and an angel comes, a legitimate angel, not a devil, an angel. If an angel comes and appears right in front of you, but he gives you another Gospel, let him be accursed. It's a serious stuff to the Apostle Paul. Never be moved. Never be shaken. Adam, why are you so passionate? I'm getting worse as I go, man. I believe this stuff. I live in this place. Holy, blameless, above reproach. Never be moved. Never be moved. Paul's like, even if I have some new revelation, I come back to you, Church of Galatia, and I start preaching another Gospel, let me be accursed. Some heavy stuff. The Gospel, let the Gospel be the Gospel which you heard. And it says, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which Paul, I've become a minister. If indeed we continue in the faith. What's my job? To believe it. My job is to believe it. My job is to continue steadfast. Because we start off like, yeah, I believe this. Thank you, Jesus. And then life comes. Curveball. Financial crisis, we lose a significant loved one. All of that's gonna happen, friends. 
I'm not up here full of passion believing this because life hasn't happened. Flip, life has happened. It's happened hard. But I refuse to be moved. I refuse to be moved from the hope of the Gospel that I am complete in Christ. You don't need anything else. You don't need hands laid on you. You are complete in Christ. You are complete in Christ. Why don't we stand to our feet as we pray? Friends, don't let life speak louder than truth. Don't let life speak louder than truth. Don't let your feelings speak louder than truth. The truth is what we just read and we read in our first Scripture today that beware, be very aware of anybody who wants to remove this truth from you. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, that previous leader, that previous teaching, that podcast, maybe my own stinking thinking, it is... It's actually robbed me from living in this truth. The Bible says, beware, don't let anybody, and they might even be sitting in the same row as you at church. Don't let anybody. If I get up here and start preaching works, and I'm not saying like works to be saved, works have a place in the Gospel, but I'm talking about legalism, don't let anybody move you. Come on, say, I am holy. I am blameless. I am above reproach. I am forgiven. I am clean. Do you believe it? Are you gonna believe it when life throws a curveball at you? Come on, we're moved. We're not moved. We are grounded and steadfast, Freedom Centre. We are, we are unmoved, unshakable on this truth that is the Gospel. If you're in here, this is uh, a message for the believer. This is a message for someone who's put their faith and trust in Jesus. Everything that I've said is only available to you if you love Him. It's not like, you're not holy if you're an unbeliever, you're an unbeliever. You're not blameless, the blame is coming to you. But friends, Jesus died on the cross so you don't have to receive the blame. So you could be made holy, so that you could be made above reproach in His sight. So just for the next couple of seconds, if you're here with every head bowed, every eye closed, let's just honour this moment. Between you and God right now, you say, Adam, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never repented, turned away from my old life and walked towards Jesus. Or maybe you have and you're not in living relationship with Him. You're not living in the freedom of what we just spoke about this morning. I'd love you to really quickly on the count of three, pop your hand up and then when I see it, you can put it back down. One, two, three. You say, Adam, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I wanna give my life to Jesus. That's me, that's me. Is there anybody here? Once you pop your hand up, you can put it back down. Once you put your hand up, you can put it back down. Is there anybody here? You say, Adam, I'm coming to Christ. I'm coming to Jesus. I need to put my faith and my hope in Jesus. If you're online and you're listening to this, make sure you comment and let us know that you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Just a couple more seconds. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, someone's waving at me. There's a hand down there. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, let's pray this prayer all together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank You for dying on the cross for me. Thank You that I am complete in You. I give my life fully to You. I surrender it to You. In Jesus' mighty Name. Can I just say how proud of this church I am? This thought just came to me. And then I'm gonna pray for everybody that we would live in this hope. I I was at a pastor's retreat in Aussie during the week and one of the pastors was saying that um, probably about 30 or 40% of his church leave as he throws the altar call. It's a real convenience culture, right? <laughs> like, I just thought, man, we don't have that problem. We don't have people leaving in the middle of the most important moment of someone's life. 
Can I just tell you that when we're throwing an altar call, it's not some token thing at the end. This is heaven or hell. This is life or death. And if you're a believer, whenever we throw an altar call, I want you praying. I want you in faith. I want you leaning in. I want you believing for that person in the room. It is literally the most important thing. And if we're like, oh, I'm hungry, I need lunch. And that's more important, we've got issues. Now I praise God, it doesn't happen here. But man, he was like hell bent against this thing and he didn't know how to change it in his church. And I thought, man, our people are glued, they're locked in. We're believing, we're in faith. And so I wanna thank you for that. Hey, as we close, let's just raise our hands if you wanna live in this truth that you are complete in Him. I know I wanna live in it. Father, I thank You for every hand raised. I thank You, Father, that we are complete in You. I thank You, Lord, that we have been made holy. I thank You, Father, that by the blood of the Lamb, we have been made blameless. I thank You that by the blood of the Lamb, we have been made above reproach. None of our works, but of Your works. Not of our doing, but of Your doing. Father, I thank You that we don't need to struggle any longer. I thank You that we would be a people who are not deceived, are not cheated, are not uh, moved away from the grounded and steadfast truth that is that we are complete in Him. Come on, we're gonna declare it. I am complete in Him. Come on, let's say it again. I am complete in Him. Again, one more time. I am complete in Him.